In this episode of the How To Get On Reality TV podcast, we talk to reality TV expert Rob Sesternino and his opinions on the state of casting. Welcome to the How To Get On Reality TV podcast with Dan Geesling, where I answer your reality TV casting questions once a week. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 50. That's crazy to think, yes, 50 of the How To Get On Reality TV podcast. I'm Dan Geesling, and as always, I'm really excited to be here today. We have a great show for you. I brought on Rob Sesternino from Rob Has A Website and Rob Has A Podcast. Um, he is, in my opinion, the foremost expert on reality TV. He's interviewed hundreds of reality TV personalities. He's been on uh, Survivor two times. He's been involved in Survivor and Big Brother casting. He has a lot of knowledge to share. And it's rare that we get a chance to hear him share his own story because he's often pulling or interviewing people to get their stories out when they're whether it's someone that's recently been voted off the island or kicked out of the house. Uh, but before we get into episode 50, I want to remind you guys about the guide that I wrote. It's how to get on reality TV, the complete step-by-step guide. It's a guide that takes you from A to Z gives you worksheets, does every, teaches you everything you need to know to be put yourself in a position to be successful in casting. Um, you know, it, it's helped people get cast on the show. It's helped me turn off my text messages. Um, you can find out more about the guide at howtogetonrealitytv.net slash guide. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and throw it over to Rob Sesternino for our special 50th episode. I do want to give you guys a heads up. If you are watching on YouTube, uh, the video is a little bit different than normal. It's, it's not uh, the high quality. Um, at least on my side, we gave the high quality to Rob. But if you're listening, that has no effect on you. But without any further ado, Rob Sesternino, ladies and gentlemen. All right, super excited to be here today on the 50th special episode of the How to Get on Reality TV podcast. And what would be a 50th milestone episode without bringing probably the, not probably, the most well-known reality TV podcaster in the business, not to mention all-around good guy, two-time survivor, and a man who's got an, an array of plaid shirts that are second to none. Rob Sesternino, thanks so much for joining us today. Dan, thank you for having me on the golden edition of the How to Get on Reality TV podcast. Hey, I, I'm I, when I had the chance to ask you, you know, I couldn't let it slip by just because you've been such a staple in the reality TV community, not only you know when you're on Survivor, but more so even after the fact. You know, for those people that don't know, uh, Rob has a podcast. Uh, you can check it out. Rob has a website.com. But what Rob does is he's he's interviewed hundreds. I would even say, could, would we be in the thousands of reality TV contestants? We'd have to do some accounting on that, okay. Dan, and you know that's not my uh, <laughs> best trait. Okay, so so Rob, we're getting there. Yeah, you get you got to be getting close. So Rob's interviewed hundreds, we'll say hundreds of reality TV contestants. Um, has interacted with a lot of different types of people, all different types of characters, and so to me, he's the foremost reality TV expert in the business, in my opinion. And I'm I'm sure Rob won't toot his own horn, but I'll toot it for him. And it's really you know it's special to have him here because um you know he, he comes with such expertise and and has a lot of firsthand accounts of dealing with a lot of people that uh you know thanks for coming on so we can pick your brain a little bit about the state of reality tv casting well it's always fun to uh talk about it and uh really happy for uh, you having me here i feel like this is like the super bowl 50 <laughs> yeah this is huge we, we'll have like the golden we'll, we'll make sure everything's golden in the golden fi- microphone you need it <laughs> maybe when how many podcasts have you done rob lifetime <laughs> lifetime it's a lot i know we did the 1000th episode of rob as a podcast back in november so probably you know closing in on like 1500 or or even more before we get into the casting questions have you ever thought about that and like counted to a thousand like just sitting there like and then for every count like that's a full podcast i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> have you like i know how do you fathom that I don't think about it, Dan. I just try not to think about it. And I say that, okay, this was good. And I don't think about it like that I wasted my uh, entire <laughs> life on this. So, I, it's fun, but it, it, it's really like, uh, you know, if, that there's a lot of people that would probably say it's sad also. So, no, I would I, not people that are listening to this, but people that uh, that are not interested in getting on reality TV would probably think it was a very sad state of affairs, but it's been a very fun ride. I strongly disagree with that. I think what you've done with your show from inception and now, you know, is incredible. And, uh, you know, I always tell you that you, you've, you've taken an idea and you've turned it into a full-fledged business. And not, not only that, you, you provide so much value to the reality TV community. You know, you're not sitting there talking about Survivor Amazon for the thousandth time, you know, you're pulling out great stories from people and, and really adding a ton of value. 
Well, yeah, I try not to spend a lot of time talking about myself and my own experience, which I think makes me probably very unique in the reality TV <laughs> realm because it's a lot of people. And that's what makes these reality shows great because most reality people are like, hey, but what about me? <laughs> Let me tell you about what happened to me. Forget about what happened to these other people. Let me tell you about more about what's going on in my world and with my story. And so I make it's very easy for me to pull those things out of people because the reality stars tend to be uh, oversharing. Well, and that's a great, you bring up a great point that you don't often talk about your experience, but we're going to get into your experience because you have a really unique perspective, especially from the old school days of reality TV. But before we get into that, you know, I want to ask you a question. You know, we mentioned earlier, you've seen like you've interacted with hundreds of reality TV contestants and, you know, specifically talking about casting and you kind of hit on that now, like what are some traits that you've seen maybe uniformly throughout all these people that have been on a wide range of shows? Well, I think that the people that are on these shows, I think there's really two kinds of people. I think there's the person that really understands everything that's going on there and is able to really process all of it and come up with what would best work in any given scenario. And that's why they're so effective. And I certainly say that uh, the guy I'm talking to definitely fits in that first <laughs> category. And then there's the people who really have no idea about what's going on and don't get it at all. And that's why they're so great because they lack that self-awareness. So I think that on the two ends of the spectrum in terms of great reality TV, the people that get it 100% and then the people that have no idea what's going on, they probably think they get it, but they definitely don't. And that's what makes them fascinating to watch. Got it. You know, and, and on this podcast, we, from time to time, we tend to take people that don't have an idea and try to educate them a little bit, but more so we try to help focus on the people that have a little bit of understanding of the process. So when you, I want to focus on that type of, of character, that type of, you know, you, you, you see, you've, you've got these people in two buckets. So when you've interacted with people who've understood the process, you know, have you, have you picked up on anything from them or processed any stories that ha had them separate themselves from, you know, people that didn't make it on a show? Well, I think that the people that don't make it on the show tend to be the people that don't really understand who they are and why they would be interesting television. I think that so much of what we're trying to do with get on to these reality shows, I think that people want to get on the shows because, well, I should be on the show because I love the show. And that's not necessarily what's in it for the casting people. Of course, you love the show. Of course, you want to be on the show. They understand that. But you have to sort of understand what you bring to the table in terms of a person on the show. Why would people watch you on this show week after week? Why would people root for you or root against you? And if you don't understand that yourself going into this process, then I don't think you have a great shot to ultimately get on one of these shows. That's a great point. You know, and specifically you talk about rooting for or against. So when you see someone on reality TV, you know, I think we're probably in agreement is the best people on reality TV are the people that invoke either like, oh, you want this guy off the show or, oh, you really want this person to win. So for you, you know, when you, what, what have you been able to take from this experience or from you talking to everyone that you think would really help someone who maybe is a little unaware of how to do that? Because you've seen so much reality TV where you can like pull those things out. So how can you help someone focus on what is rootable for them or what is what would make them someone root against them? Well, there's a lot of factors that happen on the actual shows, and typically it's such a reality TV trope that the audience always roots for the underdog. And I feel like every season of Big Brother, I never really understand why the people in the house don't understand that the people at home are rooting for whoever is not in power in the house, that the people in power in the house always tend to think America is rooting for them and rooting against the one person who has no allies in the house. And it's always the opposite. That's always going to be the most popular person. But in terms of getting onto the show, I just think you have to have a consistent, clear point of view in terms of who you are presenting to those casting directors and coming up with what that short elevator pitch is in terms of who you are and what the lens in which you view the world is and that everything that you say and do needs to be put through that filter of that character that you are very clear about who you are. Okay. So, you know, I think one of the most controversial statements in, 
in our little niche or specifically the niche that, you know, I try to help people get on. It's always hear people say, you know, to get on reality TV, all you have to do is just be yourself. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you need to be yourself, but I think you need to be an amplified version of yourself. And I think that you also need to understand who that self is that you're projecting. Because I think that most people really see themselves as very fleshed out, three-dimensional characters or or three-dimensional people. Because, of course, everybody has very layered nuanced feelings on a variety of things, especially people that are, you know, want to be on a reality show. They tend to be over sharers and want to talk about everything. But I think it's really important to try to narrow yourself down to almost like a two dimensional characteristic and think about sort of like the way that you would talk about iconic fictional characters and Think about like people from, you know, your favorite characters from TV shows and movies and you know exactly how they feel about certain things and they love certain things and they hate certain things. And if you think about like the reality TV characters that have really popped, that there's things that you know about them and think about yourself in those ways and how would you describe yourself as a person to somebody who didn't really know who you are and then how are, what are the ways that you look at the world. And I always say to people that ask me for help, like there's no middle ground. Like there should be no gray area in yourself as a person in terms of if somebody asks you if you want ice cream, it's like, well, I could go for chocolate. Sometimes I like vanilla. It's you hate chocolate. I love vanilla. Vanilla is the worst flavor in my entire life. I would rather eat never have never have ice cream again if I have to have vanilla. Or I you want to be very bold in what you're saying. Like I'm not asking you to lie. If you hate chocolate, don't say you like chocolate. But if you are sort of don't like chocolate, say you hate chocolate. Okay, that's a great point. That's an interesting way of looking at it in terms of a two dimensional character. Can you give us any examples of you know people that just popped to ha- to mind, whether Survivor, Big Brother, people that you see as a two dimensional character on television? This is not talking about them in their everyday life or from a personal standpoint. I mean, if you take a look at people like just to go back to the most recent season of Big Brother, I think like a character like Austin, I know he was not a beloved character, but I think that you could sort of like if you ask somebody to describe him, I think they could say like, oh, okay, well, Austin, he has he has the top hat and he does he has certain things that that he says or or does and things that things that he hates and he loves. And people like Johnny Mac is another character that really pops like that, where it's very, you know, he's a clearly defined character that you get who he is, where there are other characters where you don't really know really too much about them. And it's hard, the harder it is to describe who they are as a person, I think that the less they hit on those people as characters. So do you think reality TV in general does a does an interesting job of simplifying people for, to, for mass audiences? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I think that not just reality TV. I also think that other characters, like if you think about a show like The Big Bang Theory, like the characters on that show, you definitely say, okay, well, Sheldon, he loves he loves this, but he always hates it when this happens. And I think that really well-defined TV characters, you can really uh, – drill down to what their likes and dislikes are and who they are as people and their character traits and their flaws as well. And that's how I think you need to start thinking of yourself when you're going through this casting exercise, not as a complicated person who's very nuanced, but as a TV character and your character, what are the things you love? What are the things you hate? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? And how would you sort of describe yourself to another person if you were a fictional character? Okay. So that makes sense. Because most people, I I would argue, you know, feel that they are very nuanced, that they're very complicated people. So how do you, you know, I think you did a great job breaking it down, but you know, where do you start if you're that person? So you're Rob Sesternino and you want to get on Survivor, you know, how, where would you start to do that? Well, going back to my own experience with casting, I think that what I tried to say was that I was a 23, 24 year old guy. And what I talked about a lot in my interviews was I was the guy who lived in my parents' basement, who was not necessarily a loser, but I was the guy who really just wanted to go on the show and meet women because I didn't know any women in, in real life. And I lived in my parents' basement. I had no privacy, and this was terrible. But if I could just get on one of these shows, then I could be meeting all these women in the house and going on dates. And I sort of had like the loser but was very uh, – 
you know, very excited to be around around these women and the, sort of the, the funny guy who was going to be, you know, making light of all of these situations and things like that. So that was sort of my character going into it. And I made sure that I was always talking about how, oh, I can't wait to get in that house. And you wouldn't believe I have you know, pr- no privacy and my, my parents uh, that they, you know, I have to stay in the basement. And if I ever met, if I ever met a woman, like I couldn't <laughs> get her to come to where am I going to bring her? Cause I live with my parents. And so just talking about that and really just feeling out what's working and what's not working and just giving them more of that thing that you feel like is working when you're getting that positive response. Okay. So I want to, you know, enlighten the audience about your reality TV experience, because I I'd say most people know you either from your podcast or from you're on Survivor two times. Once was season three, was that correct? Amazon? Uh, season six. Was season Amazon. six. And then the All-Stars, right? Eight, yeah. Eight. So six and eight. So, But prior to that, you were a finalist for Big Brother season three? three. Okay. Yes. So tell me, what show did you apply for first? In so th- I fell in love with Survivor during the summer of 2000. I really wanted to be on Survivor, but Survivor was increasingly uh, getting harder every season. I watched Survivor Africa. I'm like, I don't want to go on Survivor because I don't know anything about camping or living outdoors. But I really fell in love with Big Brother 2 during the summer of 2001. And, and Will Kirby, I thought, was the you know the greatest thing ever. Watching him on live feeds, I said, oh, this would be so much fun to go. And imagine spending the whole summer in the Big Brother house. I really thought that would be a dream come true. So come the spring of 2002, I sent in a tape to CBS to be on for Big Brother 3. And I ended up making a tape which was sort of I was supposedly being interviewed by Julie Chen the morning after I had won Big Brother 3. So it was sort of like and I did like a thing where I had her on like a computer screen and sort of like her mouth like animated moving. (laughs) And it was sort of like then my sister was like doing the voiceover of Julie Chen. Like, oh, we're here with Rob Sesternino, the winner of Big Brother 3. I was like, oh, Julie, good morning. (laughs) And I was talking about how like, um, you know, how I played the game. and, And I was talking about my strategy, which was in the video I had said like, and you know, Julie, a big part of my strategy was how I got all of the women in the house to really fall in love with me. And they were all very interested in me. And they all wanted to get with me the entire time. And, and, and she's like, I, Rob, I don't remember that that happened. And I was like, oh, what? They didn't, they didn't show any of that? What are you kidding me? So I, was, I got a tape from a casting director for Big Brother. And he talked to me on, on the phone. And he said he liked, he liked my tape. And again, I, like you have said uh, many times, you know, I was very excited to be talking to the casting person. And I was definitely on as I was talking with them. And then I went to... Um, you know, the semifinals, which I'm not sure if they still uh, do those anymore, but I went to a semifinals in New York and then I, they called me and had me come out to the finals and I was one of the final 50 people and I took all the tests and went to CBS and everything and thought I had a good impression. I really thought I was going to be on Big Brother 3. It, you know, it was coming down to it. It was like the end of June and I hadn't heard anything and I was making all these arrangements to go out and do that. And then I got a call from Robin Cass like at the end of June. And they were like, you know, we really liked you. Uh, and they she said, you know, Arnie really likes you, who Arnold Shapiro was one of the co-executive producers at that, at that time. And uh, but, you know, we're going to go in another direction and ended up uh, with Josh Feinberg putting him on the show because he was probably the person that I was up against. And we sort of look alike. And they put him on the show and he went on and played Big Brother 3. And I was really devastated. But I said, I'm going to try to get on Big Brother 4. That'll be my goal. And six months later, I got a phone call from somebody in Survivor who I guess had been in or Lynn Spillman had been in the room when I had gone through my CBS casting. And they were looking for somebody who was like Josh Feinberg to put on to Survivor that they were doing a men versus women season. And they liked the idea of having the guy who was there who was going to talk about all of the women And so they thought that I would be a funny person to have out there. So they brought me back out there. And this was after they had done their main casting. There was like, you know, 10 or 12 other guys that I was sort of interviewing with. And um, I went to the finals again and they had remembered me from all that. And they said, oh, Les Mundes was making fun of me. Like, hey, you're the guy that still lives in the basement, right? (laughs) But that's huge. But that's huge. The fact that the head of CBS... Remember that about that's I mean, at the point, like, did you understand what that meant at the time or are you just like, hey, Les Moon was no, I know, you know, I had known who all of the big players were because when I was in college, I had written my thesis paper about the impact of Survivor 
and reality TV and who wants to be a millionaire and sort of like non-traditional programs. So I ha- I knew who every all the players were in terms of uh you know who Les Moonves was and Mark Burnett who was there at that time and Jeff Probst was there. So I was very you know excited to be there and. You know, Lynn Spillman had said to me, like, oh, tell Mark that you wrote your paper about him. He'll love that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had said that, and I talked about how, you know, I had hoped uh, Alicia, who was a, a, a you know, a, a famous survivor on Survivor 2, who was very this very athletic woman, I said, you know, I just hope that I'm on a season with somebody like that because I need a woman like that to protect me in case there's any sort of, like, uh, horrible things out there. You know, and I, everybody was just laughing and talking about how, you know, I live with my parents in the basement, and they were, they were making fun of me, which was a good sign. And so that was really how I ended up on Survivor, which I didn't really plan on doing. I didn't really want it terribly bad i just figured i would go make a good impression for big brother four so you know from what i know about you like was that at that time like i know you lived at home and that stuff but was that stuff about the women like true and how you felt at the time or were you playing the rob oh dan i had so many dates (laughs) i I was i was lying through my teeth the whole time no i I, that i was you know incredibly desperate i couldn't (laughs) i hadn't met anybody since i was in college you know i went away to college in upstate new york in oswego uh, state university and then I came back and I was just started working and living with my parents. And, you know, I didn't know anybody. I used to just like in, you were in college, you would just know a lot of people. And then I wasn't meeting anybody. I didn't have a ton of friends or anything like that, believe it or not. And so I wasn't meeting anybody for, you know, a couple of years after I had gone to college. And so then I just said, let me make a tape to go on one of these shows. But like for being so self-deprecating, like were you playing that up or was that like at that time? Is that like what you really were? I mean, I think that that was probably a hyper okay. version of myself. Okay. So, because you talked about earlier about being like an ampl- amplified version of like yourself. And, you know, I think that's, that's great advice. You know, I want to reroute real quick because when you brought that up, I want to say from all the people that you've interviewed for your show, has there been someone that's been drastically de-amplified in real life? You know, that you're like, wow, this person is really not anything like their character. I'm sure there have been uh, certain people. I mean, I think that there's people that you expect them to be a certain way because of what you expected on the show, and they're actually much more subdued Mm -hmm. in real life. But I'm having a hard time just thinking of somebody uh, like that off the top of my head. Okay, so let's let's circle back to your so your experience. So you you applied for Big Brother three, and they pulled you for Big or for Survivor six. Yes. Okay. So you go through that process. You, when, what was getting the call like for you? Was it a sense of like you wanted to do it, but you really would rather be on Big Brother? What was that like for you? My thinking was I loved Survivor and I would ideally in a perfect world like to play Survivor, but I felt like Big Brother was much more up my alley where mm-hmm. living in a house for three months was going to be something that I actually could do, whereas Survivor was going to be something where I was going to die uh, <laughs> immediately. And so I felt like, well, at least, okay, let me go on Survivor because then at least I'll get to go to like the reunion and stuff like that. And I'll get to meet all of the former Survivors. And really, what else do I have going on? I wasn't going to say no to it. But I, I was mostly my intention was I will get in good for Big Brother 4 because I'll, I'll be in the mix more. But they'll never actually put me on Survivor. Got and it. so I went out there and then they told me while I was there at CBS, which is a different experience, I think, than most people have. Hey you're going to be on the show. And they took me immediately to the hospital to start like getting inoculated because I was leaving in four weeks. Got it. Because you said at that point, at that point in casting, the cast was pretty much already selected. They were just looking for like a onesie twosie person to add on. Right. They were going to lock the cast that day. Got it. Okay. Wow. That's crazy. Have you ever thought about like, you know, what if the stars didn't align at that moment for you? I mean, that's, that's how fickle like casting is. Yeah. I mean, I think I would have been somebody who would have probably, you know, I had this flirtation and especially after having the flirtation with the survivor thing. I think if I didn't get survivor, I think I would have continued to pursue it. And maybe I would have been just one of those guys who they like, oh, this guy again. And I might have had that label of like the almost guy. And and then it's hard to come back from that. Also, you do hear about people that they do. Oh, I was in the mix and I was on the call for this and on call for this. But it's so much easier to knock you out once you're not that fresh face. It's like, oh, this guy again. So let me ask you this. When you talk about, especially we're talking about back then, how things were different. Do you think, in your opinion, it's 
easier or more difficult now to get on reality TV? Like, and say in the modern era, let's say like post, what would you consider the modern era of reality TV? Like post 07? Hmm. Post. You know, it's, I could do it by the shows. I feel like the modern era of Big Brother doesn't exactly line up with the modern era of Survivor. I feel like the modern era of Survivor is post heroes versus villains. And I'd say that the modern era of, of Big Brother is, uh, you know, is certainly post all stars and maybe like the post modern era is maybe, I don't know, after you guys in Big Brother 14, because yeah. I feel like that's the last time they brought back, you know, returning players in a, in a way like that. And I feel like 15, 16, 17 are probably closer together because they're all new players, whereas uh, 13 and 14 have, uh, you know, a lot of returning players in that mix and sort of like post Rachel is also um, an important marker in Big Brother in terms of like you know, character and being like a big character on those shows. I, but I, I agree. Yeah. So do you think it's more, I think it's easier now. Okay. I do think it's easier now because I think that the casts have gotten fatter in terms of number of players. Like when you played big brother 10, how many people were in your cast? 13, 13. Okay. Yeah. So that was, and we started like, you know, big brother at that <laughs> point, you know, uh, started smaller. I think it was only 10 in the first season. And that number is just continued to balloon to the point where there's 17 people <laughs> on big brother 17. And then these survivor casts also, when I first played survivor, it was always 16 people, 16 people, 16 people. And now we've seen survivor cast get as high as 20 people. So one, there's more people that they're casting every year. And also I think that the number of people you're fighting against has also decreased where I feel like 10 years ago, probably twice as many people were applying to get on Survivor as now. And now, you know, you have a much uh, less competition to be able to do it. And then there's also resources like what this kind of stuff that you offer to people where you can really sort of hone what you're doing as opposed to way back when, when it was just a shot in the dark. Everybody is like, just like, is this a good idea? I have no idea what I'm supposed to even be doing on a tape. Yeah, no, I, I I tend to agree with you. I, I feel that you know, like back when when you applied, and even when I applied, it was just you know you throw something against the wall and see what stuck. And but I think even when you're applying for Big Brother Three, it was still such a like massive phenomenon. Like what what were the numbers? Do you remember what the numbers were in like Big Brother Three? It was like. Oh, I have no idea what like the actual ratings were yeah. or how many people I was competing against in terms of uh, getting on the, on the house or getting into the show. But it certainly was a much newer phenomenon than it is now. You brought up an interesting point when you're talking about, you know, being the same face again and again in casting and talking about someone that may get caught in that finals trap. You know, someone like a Troy Zan, you know, and mm-hmm. and, you know, he it took him 10 years to get cast and that sort of thing. But for you, what for someone listening right now, that's applied for survivor many, many times we use survivor as an example and maybe made it to the finals once. Like, what do you tell them? What would you tell them to push them over the edge or to encourage them to keep going or something they could tweak? I would say it's hard because each person is going to be individual. I don't know what their tape is going to be, but I think that a lot of people tend to have like these relationships with somebody there in casting at the point where you've gotten there so many times and sort of ask them, you know, what am I missing? Like, what is the what is the reason why you guys are saying no? What what's the thing that I could do to help you guys? Because I feel like a lot of people turn to, yeah, but I really want to do it. Like, I could you just do me a favor? Like, just put me on and, and I'll prove it to you. As opposed to sort of saying, like, well, let me go back to the drawing board a little bit. What's the thing that I'm missing here? Is it that, like, oh, you know, I need to be in better shape? Okay, well, let me, you know, let me really show you, let me prove to you that I can sort of bulk up this year. Or it's that I have this one part of my personality that, okay, let me work on that. So let me go back and do the work that is needed to give you what you want as opposed to, but come on, just put me on. Okay. That's a great point. So, so, and it sounds like I don't want to steer you one direction or the other, but if someone makes it to finals, do you think that that is a make or break thing for them? Meaning that, so you go to finals, does that mean at some point you think they can get cast or you think that if they screw that up, they're never going to get cast? No, I don't think it's a never. I think, but at the point where you've been to finals like three or four times and you're up on that board and for whatever reason, 
you know, Lynn or Robin or whoever always ends up like, okay, no, let's not go with this guy. I can't do it. I can't pull the trigger on that guy. I think it comes down to why. Why are they saying that? And I know that it starts to be, well, you're not the new face because they feel like, okay, well, we know this guy. He's going to be there forever. And maybe at some point we'll do it. But if you end up in that maybe pile too much, I do think you can get stuck with that. So I think it's important at the point where if you've been there a little bit, don't just keep throwing you know the same stuff at the wall the same tape go back and try to think about what is the reason why i'm not getting through and what can i be doing on my end to sort of address that i think it's a great point um and we're kind of wrapping things up here but i I do want your opinion on um, i think it'd be really interesting to hear on your opinion on the state of casting for big brother and survivor and what you think i know you mentioned besides the ballooning of the numbers have you seen a trend or anything change in, in your opinion that's been different from, you know, say the mid to early days? Well, I do think that there is a thing that wasn't always there of the person who is the super fan of the show. I feel like that that is always going to be there. And I feel like that at least in Survivor Big Brother, I feel like you're seeing more and more of those people put onto the show. I think more so on Survivor than even Big Brother. And we had a lot of people who were uh, quote unquote super fans on this current season or this most recent season of Big Brother, and I feel like Survivor also. I think we're seeing less Mactors in the mix, certainly on Big Brother. You know, we're still getting we're still getting some of them. We're, what, we're, I think what's a Mactor for people that don't know? A Mactor is, you know, sort of like a model slash actor, whether they are an aspiring model slash actor, and that's why they're going on the show, or they are some sort of model slash actor that was spotted and recruited to be on the show. I think that probably five years ago, I think we were seeing many more people who were sort of recruited onto the show, put on the show, where I feel like that these shows, as the audience has sort of dwindled to the point where it's really just the core audience, they realize that most of those people don't resonate and pop with the audience as much as the people who are the you know ride or die fans of the show who want to get on the show. So I think we're seeing more and more of those people cast on those shows as the number of overall people who are applying to the show tends to go down. I think the number of fans and super fans that are getting on the show has gone up. And do you think that partially is in reason because, like you said, there's less people watching it and the people that are left over are the ones that more are able to relate to a super fan because that's who they am themselves, that they are themselves? I think that's part of it. But I also think that those actors are not necessarily giving us good TV. And whereas the people who are the big fans of the show, now sometimes they flame out spectacularly, and that's going to be good. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're a super fan means that you are going to be good TV. But in the case of Survivor, probably more so than Big Brother, it's good to have people coming in and those are the people that are looking for the idol on the first day and the people that are like splitting the votes and flipping their votes. Whereas in Big Brother, I think it's a little bit easier to come in and be a person who doesn't really know the game and pick that up on, on you know, after watching a season. Whereas uh, Survivor, I think that there's a, you know, the Big Brother game, while very nuanced, at, you know, in the actual uh, playing of the game, the rules, I think, are a little more straightforward in terms of, okay, here's what's going to happen. People are going to be up on the block. You know, there's a veto. Whereas in Survivor, I think that there is a little more of the um, minutia of, you know, okay, we're going to split the vote. We're going to do this. We're going to put the idol on this person. And, and we'll, and, you know, we're going to pass the idol to this person. So it's a little more uh, complicated. And I think that the super fans tend to mix it up a little bit more in the game of survivor that's that's interesting an interesting take i, I do want to ask you because robin Cass, you know i see her she catches heat on twitter sometimes about you know using a lot of recruits although you know recruits go through the same process as you know someone that would apply normally what are your thoughts on um you know someone that's fixated on being frustrated with recruits what do you what would you say to those people and, and what is your take on having recruits on well, let me ask you, are this somebody who's trying to get on the show and is mad about the recruits or a fan of the show who is mad about recruits, who is not trying to actively get on the show? Someone who, who's actively trying to get on the show and is often frustrated when, you know, they see someone go on that qu- takes a knee and, and quits on week three. Right. I would say you're worried about the wrong thing. You can't control it. And you are upset about somebody who's probably not fighting for the same slot that you are anyway, that they're always going to go out and look for a recruit who's going to be 
the bikini model, the, the uh, you know, the Beckys, the Jackies of the world who are going to be those people that are going to be there. You're probably not fighting for those spots. So, you know, they're always going to be, you know, the clay on the season who's going to be the heartthrob guy. Chances are you're probably not that guy either. So don't worry about that. You just you can't control it. All you can do is control what you can do in terms of your tape, who you are on the show, and talk about what you're gonna what you're gonna be doing and who your character is and how you see the world as that character. Okay, I have two last questions for you. One's kind of random, but this is strictly out of um, pure personal interest. When when you so you were on Survivor season six when things came around for All Stars. How, what was that process like for you and from the casting standpoint? It was a definitely a unique thing that had gone on where Survivor 6 had ended and as part of like the big push to announce Survivor All-Stars that me and a couple of the people from my cast were at the big CBS upfront announcement and Mark Burnett and Jeff Probst were announcing, hey, season eight is going to be All-Stars. And we were at like the event with like Richard Hatch and Rudy and Sue Hawk was there and I think Ethan and Jerry. And so they had sort of announced, hey, or I think Tina was also there. That we, hey, this is going to be Survivor All-Stars coming up. And like somebody had asked Mark Burnett like they're like, hey, is Rob going to be on All-Stars? And Mark Burnett had said to the person, is the Pope Polish? And he was at that time. And so... <laughs> I had a good feeling about it, but I still had to go through all of the, you know, filling out paperwork and blood tests and stuff like that. But I was, I was pretty confident that I was going to be going because my season had just happened. I was like one of these people where, um, you remember like a, right, right, like a, like a Joe or a Shireen from, you know, they went right from, and again, I didn't leave for my finale, but my finale was in May and I was playing survivor again by September. So I was one of these people that, that had just played. And um, I was pretty confident that I was going to get picked for the All Stars. So when did you get the final word, or how was that delivered to you? In October of you know that year, where we went to go play at the end of the month, that about four weeks before we went to go leave, they gave me the official word of like, hey, just so you know, you know, you're on the cast, you made it. But I think that there had been talking to a lot of people. A lot of people were in the mix at that point. Got it. Okay. And my last question for you, because I appreciate you coming on and spending time with us. Out of all your, you know, reality TV experience, talk to, you know, you've interviewed hundreds of people. Uh, for someone that is desperately trying to get on, you know, whether it's Survivor, Big Brother, Amazing Race, other network shows, what's your single best unique piece of advice that someone's listening right now and saying, you know what? You, you, I know Rob has something he just wants to share with me to help out. Like, what could you share with these people that they probably haven't heard before that would, you know, help them get, put themselves in a better possible position for success to get cast on reality TV. I think that one thing is don't be afraid to talk about what you're not good at. I think that it's so much about, Oh, I'm, I'm the best at this. I'm the best at this. Like, I think it's so fun in these, in these videos that people make when people talk about, you know what I'm really terrible at, or you know what the worst thing about me is? I, I love hearing that. It's such an interesting question. It's like if you are watching one of those videos and somebody says, uh, you know what my biggest weakness is? I think it's the kind of thing like, okay, I'm interested. You hooked me. I'm, I'm going to sit up a little bit uh, taller in my chair. That Shane Powers, who has a really great video for Survivor, he has a, a moment in his video where he's like, uh, you know why I can't win the game? And it's like he points and then it's like then the camera pans to like he's got like a, a gigantic like rum and coke and like a pack of cigarettes. He's like this and this. <laughs> and so I love stuff like that in terms of what are my weaknesses, because it proves that you understand your character and it proves that you're flawed. And if you go back and Dan, I know you love uh, all these great like serialized TV shows like I do. And a guy like, you know, Walter White, where, you know, you can talk about what his flaws are as a character. And I know you love Dexter also. Yeah. Uh, what are Dexter's flaws? And so if you can also point out, like, who you are and what your superpowers are, but also, like, what is your kryptonite? What are your flaws as a character? I think it makes you a very interesting person that I'd like to see you on the show. Because now I'm imagining, okay, what's the game situation where your weakness comes into play? You know, my weakness is I can't control my temper for anything, or I can't do X, Y, and Z, or I, I crumble under pressure. And so 
Now I want to see that on TV because I can start to imagine what it's going to be like when you're out there and you're presented with that situation that you've already identified is what you, is your biggest weakness. What was uh, young two-time survivor Rob Sesternino's kryptonite in the casting process that you revealed? I would say probably that I am a wimp and <laughs> somebody who has uh, no game with the women. And I think that that's probably the uh, – and, and just to go back to that one, one last time, like it certainly was – I would love to have met a lot of women. But I was never going to be a person who was going out there in a showmance. Like had I met – a woman there who is like, okay, Rob, I am going to want, you know, <laughs> I want, you are the guy that I want to uh, spend the rest of my life with on the show. I, I really have my doubts as to whether, you know, that was going to be an, an actual realistic situation, but I knew it was something that was funny to talk about and that it was something that was going to help me get on the show. Well, Rob, thank you so much. I, you know, you probably uh, provide a lot of insight from a different perspective, and, and, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. Where can people find you and, and tell us all the amazing things you have going on right now? Yeah, I'm always talking about all of these shows that, you know, hopefully I'll be talking about you people that are watching the shows one day on Survivor, Big Brother, The Amazing Race, uh, all on robhasawebsite.com. That's where I do Rob as a podcast, and it's the easiest place to uh, find everything I'm doing. Rob has a website.com. And what's your, your schedule like for covering Survivor? How often are you on for this? A lot. <laughs> I, you know, I do a show live after Survivor. We call it the Survivor Know-It-Alls, and then I talk to... I talk to everybody who gets voted off or eliminated on these shows the day after. Uh, Amazing Race, it's, actually, it's a couple days later that they do the production uh, or the interview schedule because it's on Fridays. But I talk to everybody that gets kicked off, and then I do you know, a Survivor recap. I do an Amazing Race live recap. We did a Big Brother show after every Big Brother episode uh, this season. So you know, it's all on robswebsite.com. Are you, are, are you ever able to ask them casting questions, or are you kind of like you steer away from that because of I the... tend to not get into it because there's so much game stuff but if yeah. if you ever hear me asking somebody a casting question it tends to be because that i don't have anything <laughs> game related to ask them so i, I that's usually a, a fallback to like so how did you end up getting on the show <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right rob yeah you, it's not a great sign for the person if i'm asking them about what how did they get on the show i mean your casting stories all right all right rob well thanks so much for uh sharing your expertise with us make sure to check out everything rob related at rob has a website.com rob sesternino ladies and gentlemen thank you so much rob truly yeah, well, appreciate th it Dan, thank you so much for having me on uh podcast number 50 and uh i, I want to come back for uh also for uh 100 and uh 500 <laughs> all the milestones all right rob thanks a lot man it's always fun to talk with Rob Sester, you know, such a humble guy. He's done such a great job with this podcast. But what I love most about Rob is that, you know, he has fostered a community that provides so much value and so much insight and so much analysis to reality TV. And, and you know, we talked to him a lot about casting, but, you know, in terms of breaking down shows and really just doing a great job. If you guys haven't checked out what he has going on and you really like reality TV, you got to check it out at robhasawebsite.com. But it's, you know, it's fun. You know, I've known Rob for a while and, and uh, you know, we went to a convention together and, you know, he's just been, he's just such a great guy. And for him to share, you know, as really, I've, I really learned something from that, you know, especially at the end, his last tip in terms of talking about highlighting your weakness and, and talking about your character flaw. That's something, you know, that, you know, I've never even thought of before. And, and that's why the whole point of bringing Rob on the show was to get a different perspective. And, and I'm glad that he came on and I hope you guys got some value from that. And, and, you know, so I just want to thank Rob for coming on the show and, uh, make sure you guys check out his podcast at Rob has a website.com outside of that. Uh, I had mentioned earlier on the front end of the podcast, you want to check out the guide. Uh, it's a complete step-by-step -step guide to getting cast on reality TV. You know, whether you need help with your audition video, writing your story, figuring out what your weaknesses are in terms of creating your weird list, everything you need to know about getting started in reality TV casting, you can check it out by going to how to get on reality TV dot net slash guide. You can find out all the information you need to uh, to take a look at the guide and everything that's included with it. You can check that out by going to how to get on reality TV dot net slash guide. And also I want to thank you guys. It's been 50 episodes. It's, it's been crazy to think that, you know, 
that we've been going, you know, once a week for, you know, this long. And, and, you know, I wouldn't continue to do this if you guys weren't listening and weren't sending me, you know, emails saying, Hey, thanks, Dan, you helped me get to semifinals or Hey, Dan, thanks. You really helped me get to the next level or Hey, Dan, I'm starting to get people sending video clips of them on shows, you know, some dating shows, things that I, you know, never even comprehended when we first started the podcast. So, you know, this episode is, you know, one big thank you to you guys. And then thank you guys for, you know, continuing to, to watch and listen to the show because, you know, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. You know, I didn't know if people would continue to, to want to listen. And, and I guess at the end of the day, it just comes down to if you guys continue to listen and, and enjoy the show, I'm going to continue to make it every single week. And uh, you guys can count on those episodes coming out every Monday. Thank you guys so much for listening, watching, and being part of the show. And I will see you guys next week.